If take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and one hand of Philippians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Philippians chapter number 1. While you're turning there, let, let me also say, in, in addition to what Alex and Alex was making, last Sunday afternoon we did have a, a business meeting, our annual congregational meeting, and uh, we uh, two changes took place in the, in, in the, the leadership. Brother Kyle... Uh, Graham was uh, uh, joined our deacon board, Amen. and we appreciate that. Brother Ben Wanda uh, joined our elder board. Amen. So we, we appreciate these brothers being willing to be a part of the work and the leadership, make sure the doors get open and the lights get turned on and turned off and so <laughs> forth. That's, you know, and that, that the, the, the uh, main thing is that the, the truth keeps going out and the doctrine's clear. By the way, 1 o'clock, Monday through Friday, 1160, that's when the radio's on during the week. Don't let John be the only one listening. That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Alex did mention yesterday we had the memorial service for, for Timmy. And most of you don't know who Timmy Johnson was, but uh, he was a young, young man raised in our assembly. Uh, Pastor and Art Johnson and, and his wife, Jeannie, the, it's their, uh, their, their oldest son. And uh, he, uh, he went to be with the Lord, I think it was the 3rd of January. He lived in San Diego. And he was only in his mid 30s, so it's a sad time to lose a, lose a young one. But you know, I got thinking about it. We just sang that song when we all get to heaven. Uh, little Charlotte went to heaven, you know, recently. She's 11 years old, and uh, before that, Cheyenne Velasco, she was what 18 years old. So we've lost a lot of young people. And you know, when you get old, it's it's one thing. It's not so un- unusual for you to die. You know, you know that's coming, and so forth. We've, a number of our folks have have lost loved ones and so forth. But when you lose children, and young people, it, it's really difficult. I, I, I've said all along, parents should never have to bury their children. But that's what happens. But the great thing to know is that they, that they know the Lord and to be absent from the body. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And, and you know, Thessalonians, he says, we sorrow, but not as others which have no hope. That doesn't mean you don't sorrow, and you'll sorrow forever at the loss, an empty seat. Jonathan said about David, they're going to miss you because your seat will be empty. And when there's an empty seat at the table, it's always a sorrowful thing. But we don't sorrow as others which have no hope, because we do have a hope. Amen. And that hope is everlasting. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When your soul leaves your body as a believer now, if you're unsaved, when your soul leaves your body, you just fall off into hell. And you never get over the sense of falling, because that's what happens. But when you're saved... To be absent from the body, you move from this dimension right into the presence of the Lord. That's the hope uh, of everlasting life that you got when you trusted Christ. Second, th- first Philippians chapter 1, he, he expounds on that. Philippians 1 verse 21, for, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet I should choose, uh, yet what I should choose, I will not. For... I'm in a strict in a straight betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul's done, he, he's got, you know, he's in jail. He's older. He's got some physical problems. To depart and be with Christ is far better. Listen, better than anything you could have here, better than the best you ever had here, is to go be with the Lord. So death does, isn't an enemy. Death, actually, for the believer, is not an enemy. It lets us go into something far better. And as I was thinking about it yesterday, and I, I, I've thought about this before, um, we talk about Tim dies to be with the Lord. You know, you, you love them. They go to be with the Lord. They go to heaven. Our hope is not dying and going to heaven. Our hope is the Lord coming back, taking a gives a glorified body, and then taking us into the heavens to serve him. So our hope is in religion, you know, the idea is you just die and go to heaven. Well, then what do you do? What's there? What's it like? It is true that between the time you die and the Lord comes, you're going to be in heaven with the Lord. But that's not the end. So I thought maybe I'd spend I'm, this week and next week talking to you about that. The next week I'm going to be suffering for Jesus in California. I know, I'm not the dumbest, I'm not the brightest bulb in the in, in in the room, but I'm not the dumbest one either. February, you know, if you live in Chicago, California is a good place to have a Bible conference. In January, Florida. So I've had conferences in Florida and 
California in those two months for about 40 years. But anyway, I'm going to take the next two weeks and just talk a little bit about what, what's it going to be like when you go to heaven? What is it, what's heaven, what is heaven really like when you get there? And what are you going to be doing all day until the Lord comes? You know, the idea is you die, you die and go to heaven, you float on a cloud, you know, play a harp and drink some mint and julep and watch the, you know, little chubby angels fly around. That'd take about a week to get real boring. But that's not what heaven's like. It's not what it's going to be like. And there's some wonderful things in the Scripture, and I want to look at some verses with you. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm a Bible believer. I want you to be one. And when you look at the Bible for information, it's there. If you take it at face value, now if you want to spiritualize it, you want to allegorize it, you want to say it doesn't really mean what it says, then you, know, you, you, have, your own, you have your own problems. But what's here is real, and the Bible presents some very specific information in a very specific way. It just tells you these things so you can understand a lot about the things in heaven and what heaven's like. When a loved one dies and goes to heaven, when you die and go to heaven, it's interesting. You, you can understand things about what it's going to be like. And I want you to see those things because these things thrill me. And, uh, are, are, and I hope they will you. And I hope they can ground you in some simple understanding about what the reality of heaven really is like. So let's start 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Let, let's start there just to, get some, just to get in our minds some orientation about what, what's, what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. The Apostle Paul talks about an experience that he had. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, and I will come to visions and revelations to the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. This will be Paul in Acts chapter 14. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. I can't tell if he's alive or he's dead. Paul was stoned in Acts chapter 14, left for dead. Such an one caught up into the third heaven. Notice he talks about the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, how he was caught up into, the, into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. So what, he said, what Paul does is he talks about the third heaven, calls it paradise, and he's caught up there. It's a, it's a geographic location that he's caught up in. Now, when you talk about the third heaven, there are two ways to take it. Some people take it, well, it's the third in sequence. There's a heaven, then there's another, there's a change, there's another one, then there's a change, there's another one. But that's not what he's talking about here. He wasn't caught up into some three dimensions ahead, ahead in time. He was talking about he, he's here, he dies, he's caught up into the third heaven. So geographically, the universe is, 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 is set up in such a way that there is a third heaven, a second heaven, and a first heaven. If there's a third, there has to be a second and a first. And when you, actually on Sunday night, the last couple of weeks, we've been, we just happened, we've been studying about some of this stuff. And I'm not going, I don't have the, the time this morning or the inclination in the time to try to describe all of this and explain all these details because I want to get to the other stuff. But it's important that you can understand that there's a third heaven. There's a place up here where God lives. And it's called, it, he calls it the third heaven. This is the abode of God. This is where the throne of God is. This is where God himself abides. This is where his city is. Um, if, 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 if you look with me at Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter number 21. Now, you're going to have to get your Bible and look at a bunch of verses today. And don't just sit there and watch me. Look at the verses because you need to look at them to get the, info, get the idea here. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, this is after the great white throne judgment in chapter 20. And the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared for a bride adorned for her, as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice, John sees this city, and he see, it's the abode of God. It's where God lives, his city, and it comes down out of heaven. So the city is not heaven. The city is where heaven is, 
but heaven is the territory in which the city is. So up here in this, this third heaven, there's God's city, got the throne in it, and it, there's a territory around that city. The city comes out of heaven. So the third heaven is the territory in the heavens where God lives, where the angelic creation is, and where, the, where this function where the city is. So you have the third heaven. Then there's a second heaven. Underneath that third heaven, there is a, a second heaven. And that's the heaven where the, where, the, where, the angel, where the stars are. It's what we call the universe. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. If we, if we were going to, I'm not going to look at Genesis chapter 1 because if I do, I'll never get out of it. Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is what in, in Genesis 1 is called the firmament. And it's where he puts the star, the sun and the moon and the stars and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, what we call the, the, the universe. Deuteronomy 4 verse 19. Deuteronomy 4 19, Moses says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, should us be driven. So where, where you have the, the sun and the moon and the stars and all that up out here, that's the second heaven. So you have a second heaven, and that's what we call the universe. The Bible calls it the firmament. Then you have the earth. And on the earth down here, you have the first heaven. Come with me, if you will, to uh, Exodus chapter 38. In Genesis chapter 1, I'm, uh, he calls this the open firmament. In other words, here's the firmament, the universe. The earth is in the, firm, the, earth is in the universe, so it's a part of the universe. But there's, a only a, there's only a particular part of that firmament that is open for you and me to function in. And that's the atmosphere around the earth. Ezekiel chapter number 38. 38. Ezekiel. <laughs> if I said Exodus, that's my first mistake I've made this month. I'm ahead of John by two. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 38, verse number 20. I just want you to see how, that, that the Bible does cause these things th th this way. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowl of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things. See, he talks of the fowl of heaven. That's the, that's the atmosphere around the earth. Where, where the birds fly. In Genesis chapter 1, he makes the fowls of the heaven so they can fly in the atmosphere around the earth, and he calls that the open firmament. The part of this firmament, the part of the universe that is open for you and me, is the atmosphere around the earth that we live in. You know you can't get out of that. You go up 10,000 feet in the air, and you, and you get where well, you can't breathe. If you are a pilot and you get on a private plane and go up, I, I used to fly with Brother Leach, he'd get up about 10,000 feet, he'd get the oxygen tanks out. Because you, 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 you get that far away from the ground and the atmosphere gets thin. And you, you, your breathing problem, your, your breathing becomes a problem. If you, go, if you go into space, they put big monkey suits on the spaceman. Why? Because your body requires 14.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure against it to keep it from exploding. You're not made to live in outer space. You're not made to live in the second heaven. You're made to live in the first heaven. This is what's open to us. That's why Psalm 115 tells Israel, that the earth is yours, man's of the earth earthy, not the heavens, not the starry heavens. There are three heavens in your Bible. The third one is where, is where God lives. The second one is the universe. The first one is the atmosphere around the earth where, where we live. Now, what we're going to be talking about is the third heaven. We're going to talk about where God lives. That's the issue. Now, where is God? Come with me to Psalm 48. When you talk about a loved one goes to be with the Lord, it's a location. It's not, a, it's not an imaginary kind of thing. Well, if it's a location, it has to be somewhere. Someone says, well, we go up. But the problem saying heaven is up is that if you live in the South Pole, up would be south. If you live on the equator, up would be east or west. So which way is, you know, up would be relative to where you are. In the Bible, it's not relative. Psalm, uh, Psalm 48. The great, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of, the, of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Where is the city of the great king? 
It's on the sides of the north. Now, that's not Jerusalem on the earth because the, 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 God's presence in Jerusalem is in the eastern part of the city. This one is on the, in the north. Heaven, the third heaven, where the throne of God is, where the city of God is, is in the north. In your Bible, God is located north. Find out where north is and point there, and that's, where, that's the direction where God is. Come with me to Psalm 75. It used to be when I, I don't do this so much anymore just because I'm lazy, but for generations when I traveled, I would, one of the first things I would do when I'd get to where I'm going to be for the, the time, I'd orient myself, which way is north? <laughs> north is that way. You know why you want to know? When the Lord comes, where is he going to come out of? He doesn't come out of the south. He's not coming out of the east. That's the east. So he's going to come out of the eastern gate. Now, that, that's Jerusalem, second advent. That's, that's not anything to do with you. But he, if you're going to look for the Lord's coming, he's, he, he, his city is in. This universe has an orientation, and that's north. So if you want to look where God is, the orientation is find north. Psalm 75. Verse number 6. For promotion cometh from the east, uh, neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Well, if promotion doesn't come from the east, the west, or the south, where does it come from? From the north, right? But look at it, it says the next verse. But God is the judge. So instead of saying from the north, he says from God. Why? Because God, that's where God is. He's in the north. He's not in the east, he's not in the south, he's in the west. He's in the north. So the reality is that heaven has a location. It's in the third heaven. It's where God lives, and it has a location that's real. And I, and I say that about the location. Look, either the Bible means what it says or doesn't mean what it says. If you take it literally, just take it. You give it the plain sense of the meaning of the words, just, just the way you would talk, let it talk the way you talk. Well, maybe not the way some of you talk, but, you know, mean what you say, say what you mean. It does that you have an idea about where things are because they're real. Now, come with me back to Revelation 21 because there's some, there's, there are things, and we could use a dozen, two dozen verses about this stuff. And uh, I got a sheet. Look at all that stuff on that sheet. There's no way in the world I'm going to get through all that stuff. I wrote it down so I could just make myself keep going. And when I was making these notes together, thinking I'm just leaving these things out to put this one in. The Bible's full of this stuff. Revelation chapter 21. And I saw the new heaven and the new earth. And why in the world is there a new heaven and a new earth? And I, John, saw verse number 2. I saw the, the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he, God, will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Notice the city, the dwelling place of God, where he abides, his city, where he lives, he's going to bring it down to the earth, and it's going to dwell on the earth. The original intention of God in Genesis chapter 1, when he created the heaven and the earth, was for him to create a place in the universe for his throne to dwell. His original purpose was to set up his residence on the earth and rule the universe from the earth, the earth being the command center of the whole thing. Come back with me, just Psalm 104. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use verses that, you know, we, we don't always run over, just to give you some different verses. There's more information in your Bible about creation in the book of Psalms, in the book of Job, in the book of Isaiah, in any one of those books than there is in Genesis. Don't run to Genesis chapter 1 to think you understand everything about creation. The problem these, these, the, in the last 30, 40 years that the so-called creation science people have, there's really two problems. One, they think that through science you can prove evolu evolution is wrong. All you've got to do is read Genesis 1-1 and you know evolution is, an, is, is a nut case. In the beginning, God created. Any questions? Well, you either believe he did or he didn't. Why? Well, the book said he did. Believe the book? He did. If you don't, if you don't think God created the heaven and the earth, why? Because you don't believe the book. You think you're smarter than God. But the problem with the, with the creation, evolution, creation science is they're trying to take, take 
things outside the Scripture and prove the Scripture. You don't need to do that. And you're never going to do it that way. The Bible proves that, not that proves the Bible. And by taking Genesis 1 as, the, listen, when Moses wrote Genesis 1, the nation Israel already knew everything about, his, about these things. And he's writing Genesis 1 as a summary for them to introduce what, what, what the book of Genesis is about. I told you I shouldn't get into all that. See, that's not, none of that's in my notes. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. Let there be light. He, he that calls light out of darkness, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. God takes the heavens and he stretched them out, molded them, put them there. Who layeth the, the beams of his chamber in the waters. Who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the, wa the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his, men his ministers a flame of fire, who hath laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever, that covers it with the deep as with a garment, and the waters stood above the mountains. You go back to Genesis 1, the earth is without form and void, and darks is upon the face of the deep. There's the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And he said, let there be light. And then you have that six days of repurposing of his creation. When he did that, and those, when, he, when he moved upon the face of the, what's he doing? Why is he doing that? Look at verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and renewest the face of the earth. When God goes into renewing his, 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 his creation after the fall of Satan and the destruction, the rebellion, He's laying his, the beams of his chamber, verse number 3 says, verse, in the literally laying a foundation in the earth as he recreates it for his throne to sit on. He's literally placing a place, creating a place in the universe, on the earth, for his house to come down to. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation, from the foundation of the earth? Every question, the answer is yes. Israel knew all of those things. They knew all of that before Moses wrote Genesis. Moses wrote Genesis 1 to people who already knew all these things. So when he says the things he says in Genesis, they already know the scriptures that he's, that, that he's outlining there. It is he that, verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens, that's what we read in Psalms, as a curtain, and spreadeth them out, watch, as a tent to do what? Dwell in. So when God created this thing back here and, 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 perp and do does all this and, and, and creates that firmament and the earth sets the earth in and brings it all back to life, he's doing it, stretches it out as a tent to dwell in. He's putting it together as a place he's going to dwell. And his plan is to dwell with his throne, his city, on the earth. In some Psalms, you're not in Psalms, you're in Isaiah, aren't you? Look at Psalm 132. Go back to Psalms. Get Psalm 132 in one hand in Exodus chapter 15. This is what Israel knew. They knew their place, their purpose, and the plan of God. We talk about Israel being God's earthly people. There's a reason for that. God has a plan for the earth, and he's going to use the nation Israel to accomplish that plan in the earth. Deuteronomy chapter, Exodus chapter 15 when Israel comes out of, the, out of Egypt, goes across the Red Sea in chapter 14, Moses sings a great song. It's called the Song of Moses. And he explains what's happening and why God's doing this. God's brought his people out in order to bring them in. Here's what he created the nation of Israel for, verse 17. This is what they sing, Exodus 15, 17. But thou shalt bring them in, plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, 
in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, in thy, in the sanctuary, O Lord, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. God has a piece of place, a place on the earth, Palestine, where he's going to put his throne. And all the creation had to do with, with, with accomplishing that. Psalm 132. I was trying to remember what verse I told you. Psalm 132. Here's a psalm about David. The instrumentality with which God is going to restore his authority over planet earth. He creates a man out of the dust of the earth. He's of the earth earthy. Man sins. God promises a redeemer, a seed of the woman, who's going to come and reclaim the authority, restore man back to his original purpose. The seed of the woman becomes the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham becomes the seed of David, the covenant God made with Abraham and David to accomplish his promise. Psalm 132 is about that covenant that God made with David. Verse 13, the Lord God hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his, what? His habitation. God chose Jerusalem to be the place he's going to live. Go take his city, put it there. This is my rest forever. You ever wonder what the Sabbath rest was about? It's not about you being, you know, taken off on Saturday so you're not too pooped to work on Monday. It's where all the work's done and God says, I'm going to wet. Here's my rest. Here will I dwell. For I've desired it. So God's original intention, his purpose, is to take his throne and put it on the earth in a piece of real estate that he's prepared for it. Now, that issue... The earth, as he creates it, go, go back to Job chapter 38. When, he, when, when they watch him creating in Genesis 1, they're seeing him construct a site, a place, a location to put his city. So what you're looking at in Genesis 1 is God creating the location, preparing the site for which he's going to come and place his dwelling. Job chapter 38. God speaks to Job, and he says to him, verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee. And answer that. When he says, gird up your loins like a man, he's not talking about, you know, put your big britches on, guys, let's talk. Gird up your loins. Think like a think like man is supposed to think. This is the oldest book in the Bible. Job already knows how a man, how does God want you to th how, does, how does he want the man he put in the earth to think? Think like this. Here are the questions. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? So where was, God when, where was Job when God laid the Genesis 1? He, he wasn't even a bad dream of, of, of his mom and dad. He didn't exist. So who's going to tell you what happened back there? Well, Job couldn't because he wasn't there. But notice he laid the foundations of the earth. Declare if thou hast understood. Who hath made the laid the measure thereon, if thou knowest. Or who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon the, are the foundations fastened? And who laid, who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the, star, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I just want you to see in that, in that passage who laid the foundation, who stretched the line on it, who laid the... That's all construct. They're watching the construction and he says, when I constructed the planet, who was there? Nobody. But I was. And I obviously had a plan because I knew how why I knew, I knew what the measure was supposed to be. I knew what the plumb line was supposed to be. I knew where the foundation was supposed to be. He's, he's reminding Job that when he created everything, he had a plan already in mind. You go to Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 8, and you'll see... He literally was working off a blueprint called wisdom. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So when God put all this together, it wasn't just throwing it against the wall and see what was going to happen. He's got a plan for what he's doing, and he constructed the universe and the earth in particular in a particular way so his city could be there. So now go with me back to Revelation chapter 21. Notice what he did in that construction by noticing what's there. And this, is the, this, to me, is the part that's exciting. What that means is if he created things here the way they are, he did it on purpose, not by accident. 
And he did it according to a design that he already had in mind. So if you look at Revelation chapter 21, look at the city that he created, just verse 10. Revelation 21, verse 10, And he carried me away into the, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having, now, now notice, it's a high mountain. Now, we live in the Midwest. There aren't any mountains around here. This, you know, our, our ground is about flat as a pancake. But, you know, you go south down, to, down Tennessee, they got mountains. they got hills. You go out west, Colorado, they got mountains. You go from here to Denver. First time I ever drove from here to Denver, it was so disappointing. It's flat the whole way. Flat as a pancake. But when you get to Denver, you're, 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 you're 5,200 feet in the air. You're a mile up. You're about 700 feet here. So you're, it's going up, but it's all flat. But right beyond Denver, there's a town called Boulder, and that's where the Rockies start. And, man, they are big. And I'm from down south, and you, you, you think you've got a big mountain down in Tennessee, Grandfather Mountain, it's 5,000 feet tall. The, the Rockies, look, Denver's flat, and it's 5,000 feet. And the Rockies go up to, you know, 10, 12, 14,000 feet. You get up in those mountains. You know, the original mountains were in heaven. See what he said there? He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. The original mountains weren't here. The original mountains were up there. And he showed me a city. You know who built the first city on the earth? Cain. Built it in rebellion against God. Where did he get the idea for a city? God already had a city. When you see cities down here, the original was up there. Having the glory of God as a light was like unto a stone most precious. Even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And there's a wall, great and high. You know who had the first wall around a city? It wasn't Trump. God put a wall up. Where do you get that idea down here? The original's up there. Now, what he's doing, what you're learning from that, is when you see what's up there, that's the original. And he makes duplicates of that down here. Stone. Precious stones, jasper, crystal. The wall has 12 gates, doors, go in and out of. The 12 tribes and so forth. If you go down to verse number 18, build a wall of it as, as jasper. The city was pure gold. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with the manner of precious stones. The first foundation is jasper and sardine. and Look at all those... You ladies like jewelry? Where did all that stones come from? Where are the diamonds and, and, the, and, and the, the gold? Where does all that come from that's down here? It's a duplicate of what's up there. The point is that when God started creating things, he's got the, he's got the heaven, and then he, that's the pattern, and he creates things down here that reflect what's in heaven. Look over at chapter 5. Now, when I say that to you, I don't know if you get the, get, the, you get the impact of that, but the things that are here are patterned after the things in the original. So when you are absent from the body and present with the Lord, you get to heaven, it's not going to be some strange, weird, Star Wars kind of environment. It's not going to be like Star Trek and all the different goofy things. You're going to be transported into an environment that you're very familiar with. Why? Because the environment you're living in now is, is a replica of that. You follow that? That's, that's a, man, that's exciting to me because I can look around down here. Sin has marred what's down here. You get there, it won't be any more of sin. Somebody says, we want to go see the Grand Canyon. It's a big ditch. Been there, I've seen it. <laughs> it's beautiful. But you know what it is? It's a ditch. It's the, it's the, the mar of a, of a sin-cursed earth, and yet it's, it's, it's spectacular. And you think, wow, think of what it's going to be like in heaven when you take away any touch of sin. That's going to be something else. 
because things down here are patterned. That's the original. And when he created things down here, he created it. He creates down here things that are up there first. So when I think about heaven, I think that's not going to be that's not going to be some strange, hokey environment. It's going to be very comfortable. It's going to be something I'm used to. But it's going to be it's going to be without any touch of sin. Chapter five, Revelation five. I saw in his right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and without on the backside. They have a written language in heaven. Psalm says the word of God settled in heaven forever. They have a language that's written down. They have the material to write on and preserve it. And you think, wow, that's sort of like what we got here. You understand what we do here is what they did up there first. And when he creates stuff down, look, look back at chapter 4. When he creates stuff up there, and create, when he creates things down here, it's a reflection. Things here are patterned after things that originate there so that it's not going to be a totally foreign environment when we get there. That's, that, that's my point to you. Chapter 4. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. They have doors where you can go in and out. Back in Genesis, it talks about the windows of heaven, where stuff comes out of. Well, you got stuff here like that. And you say, who had that idea? Here it is. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So now you've got the throne where God sits in heaven. And he that sat on it looked like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a, a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like unto Emerald. Ezekiel chapter 1 says it's a, the glory of his presence like a rainbow. Now you thought rainbows would have started down here, didn't you? No, the rainbow down here is a reflection of the rainbow from up there, the refraction of light that was his glory. The original is there. We got the copy. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I, uh, uh, I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their forehead crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps uh, of fire burning before the throne. And there were the seven spirits of God. Now, now, now just... Look at that and think about that for a, for a minute. And just back up and, you know, put your, put your brain in, in gear. If you've got seats for these elders to sit on, where do they come from? Somebody had to make them. If you had to make them, you had to have workmen. If you had work, work, you had to have material. Somebody had to get the material together and then craft them and make them and then sit on them, have the seats for the elders to sit on. None of this is the I dream of genie and it appears. None of this in the Bible is, 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 is presented as, as some magic. That God said, okay, we need some seats. There, there they are. No, that's not the way things appear in the Bible. But you got seats, and I think, wow, that's a you got lamp, lamps of fire burning. That means you had to have some combustible material to burn. That requires an atmosphere where the burning can take place. You, you follow what I'm saying? You know all about that down here. But he says what's down here is a replica of what's up there. By the way, the four and twenty elders are sitting on the seats. You know why I sat down instead of floated off in the air? It's called gravity. Obviously, there's some people try to, you know, nobody can explain what gravity is. But you have gravity because there's gravity up there. So that you don't have to have sticky shoes to stick to the ground so you don't fly away. The creation you have here is a reflection 
of the original up there. I hope you're getting what I'm saying to you. Look, look, look down at verse number. I love this one. You're going to like this one. Verse 7. The first beast was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third like a man. The third like an, uh, fourth like an eagle. Animals. You know where the original animals show up? In heaven. Not down here. What's, what's down here are, rep, are replicas of what he created up there. And when I said she's going to like this one, look at chapter 19. Verse number 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. You know where the original horses were? In heaven. And I bet they got some donkeys up there, too. <laughs> she got donkeys and horses and a horse. Think about that. Look back with me at Second Kings, chapter number number two. In the angelic realm, all these creatures are there. So when they're created down here, it's a replica of what's there. Second Kings, chapter number two, verse number eleven. This is Elijah. And it came to pass as they, they still went on and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. So you've got chariots of fire and horses of fire. Verse 12, Elijah saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. But you know what those were? Those really were angels, angelic horses, angelic chariots. Look over at chapter 6. Verse 17, and Elijah prayed, said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. His servant saw all the, the enemy on the, on the hills, and Elijah said, they are with us and more than with them. And the guy said, I, I can count how many are with us, and I count how many, I don't make any sense. So Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes, let him see. And the Lord opened the, the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. That's the angelic host protecting them. He opened his eyes, he could see into that. Now, their horses, are, their flesh is made out of fire. That's not a horse down here. That's a horse in the angelic realm. And their chariots. Now, think about that just for a minute. If you've got horses, does it take a lot to take care of a horse? Okay, there's your testimony. They got some folks up there with stables. You know what you do when you have a stable? Some of that. There's some, if they're out running, you have to take, you have a ton, chariots. Somebody's got to take care of the chariots. You got to have stables. You got to have storehouses. All of this stuff is real in the heavenly realm. We have it down here. Now, they don't have the problem of the shoveling because they don't have the, the poop problem. And they don't have the problem of the wheels coming off the chariot. Sin doesn't affect them. The generation doesn't affect them. But you still have, you get the idea of what I'm saying to you. This stuff is real, and it's, it reflects what's here. You're in Revelation? Or you're not, go to Revelation chapter 19. You have horses, you have chariots, you have life, and the things that go on here are, are here because the pattern's in the heavens. So when, when you go absent from the body, present with the Lord, you're not going to be in an environment that's, that's spooky. That's a comfort because people fear what will heaven be like. Well, going to, it's going to feel like you're moving into a better place than you've been living here. But it's going to be like it. Revelation 19, verse 11. I'll make it four, verse, here's the second advent, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven. Now, if you have armies of angels, armies require discipline. They require barracks. They require weapons. They require training. There's a lot of activity going on in heaven. That was with it, 
that he should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he tread upon the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. Verse, I was, that's verse 15. Verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen. Early in the chapter says, fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Angels were fine linen. You know what linen is? It's a cloth made out of a plant, a flax, a, a, a flax plant. Somebody has to grow a flax plant, take it, harvest it. That means you've got to plant it. It means you've got to have a farm, some open space. You've got to plant it. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to harvest it. Then you have to take it after you've harvested it and process it into linen, manufacturing plant. Then you have to take that linen and take it to a textile industry and make a garment out of it. You're going to have to have some artisans. You can have some people. I mean, you've got a whole industry in heaven. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in heaven. That's the point. A lot of stuff going on down here that reflects what God was doing up there. You remember the verse in Matthew, our Father chart in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earth ain't the only place there's a lot of stuff going on. There's all kind of activity in the heavens. And God didn't choose to just magically do this. He didn't magically do it there. He doesn't magically do it here. The reason for that is all through your Bible, God has, for example, in the angelic creation, the point is that they are participating in the execution of His will. They're participating with Him in His work. Instead of Him just going, whoo, whoo, and it happening, He says, look, we need this. Here's, you do this. And they work together with, they are laborers together with God to produce some linen for the angels to wear. In this case, appropriate for warriors. And another place appropriate for other activities. So they have different designs. And all the things that it takes to do that, God has them participating with him to accomplish it in the heavens. So when you come down here, really what you're doing down here is you're discovering how things work in heaven and making them operate. One of the ones that I come back with me to Psalm chapter 78. I, this is one of the, I, I love this one just because I like it. Uh, you, People tell me, you know, I, you guys know I like Dr. Pepper, and people tease me about that. And down south, there's, a, there's, an, there's an old advertising slogan that says, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, let, let's stop and have a moon pie and RSC, which is a, not a Dr. Pepper, but it's, it's a Royal Crown Cola. Let's have a moon pie and RSC. Let's, let's stop and have a little refreshment. So I tell people, well, Dr. Pepper is what the angels eat while they're eating their manna. Good for manna food. Look at Psalm 78. Now think about this. Verse number 22. Because they believed, talk about Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation, though He had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven, and had opened the doors of heaven and rained down from heaven manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. And he set their meat to the full. Manna is angel. Manna is what the angels eat. You didn't know angels ate, did you? They drank Dr. Pepper. They eat manna. <laughs> manna is called the corn of heaven. It's the grain that they make the manna out of. Now, where do you get grain? You gotta have a farm. You gotta have a production system. You gotta have a bakery. You understand? Feeding angels is real. Producing what they eat is real. Now, down here, we don't produce manna, but we got corn. It's a grain plant to grow. It grows in heaven to feed the angels. Down here, it grows. You remember, by the way, Paul said, I was caught up in the paradise. Paradise is a garden. He said, I was caught up in the garden of God. Where's there a garden of God? Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Eden is called the garden of God. God's growing things in the heavens. He grows. He has a garden where he's growing. The grounds that surround that city are full of life 
in activity. Now, the earth is modeled after God's heaven. He literally duplicating it on the earth. And he, with, with a, when he developed the earth, it's just with a similar topographical features as the heavens. So when you get to heaven, my point is, it's not going to be that screwy. It's not going to be that outlandish. It's going to be a, a, an environment that you are familiar with, but that is so much more wonderful than what you've had here. You're just going to be overwhelmed with it. It'll be breathless. One other thing, Daniel chapter 10, about the activity that's in heaven. The angelic creation is busy. You're not going to go to heaven and sit on a cloud, drink mint julep, and, 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 and you know, serenade the angels with a harp. You're not going to sit and drink manna, eat manna and drink Dr. Pepper and just sit around. You'd be bored out of your, out of your gourd, even those, those of you think you need two or three years off. I've laughed about things for years that people say, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? I said, I'm going to ask the Lord to give me 400 years of R&R &R, and I'm going to spend it in San Diego. San Diego is my city I like. And it actually, actually is where uh, Brother Tim went to be with the Lord. And I, I laugh. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing about that because you're not going, you're not going to need R&R. &R. But there's activity, there's busyness. In Daniel 10, there's a really interesting passage where the angels... Uh, Daniel had prayed and asked God about some things, and God commissioned an angel to go tell him the answer. Verse 13, 10, 13, the prince of the kingdom of, of, of Persia withstood me. Well, let's start in verse 12. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the Lord, thy word came, w w were heard, and I came for thy word. So from the first day Daniel prayed, God sent Gabriel to answer him. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one of the 20, one in 20 days. And lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, now Michael is the head of the armies of God. He's the commander of the armies of God, Revelation 12. So here's Gabriel. He's coming down through the heavens. The heavens have a whole system of passageways, highway systems. We didn't develop the interstate system. Eisenhower didn't, didn't, didn't invent it. It was already an, an issue. But there's this interstate system all through the heavens from up here that comes down to the earth. But when it does, the heavens are divided into territories, into dominions, just like the earth is. Michael comes down, and he comes through one, and they put up a stop and say, let's see your passport. And his paperwork didn't didn't pass inspection. So they held him up for 21 days. He sends back to headquarters, and here comes Michael, and Michael says, hey, that paperwork works. Came from the throne. Get out of the way. The, the guy that's you know, withstanding him is, is, is one of the adversaries guys. And he came to help, and he got through. Now, the point there is that there's governmental structure up there. There's governmental activity. Angels deliver messages. They have traffic stops that stop them. They have diplomatic relationships that come and open it up. The kind of things that you and I are familiar with, we didn't invent all that. That's the way life works in God's creation. So when I say that to you, angels have a very, and I say that to you, angels have a very special relationship to the nation Israel. If you see chapter 12, also, I then the first year, uh, no, chapter 11, chapter 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Michael represents, guards over the nation Israel. Hebrews chapter 1, he says, The angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister them that are heirs of salvation. That's Israel. In your Bible, angels have responsibilities to guard the nation Israel. Come with me to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse number 20. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless you the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his, 
that do his pleasure. Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to the heirs of salvation. And what are they ministering? They're, they're taking God's commandments, God's word, what God has told them to do. They got jobs to do, functions to take on in connection with establishing the nation Israel as his agency through which he's going to reclaim the earth. So God establishes this angelic guardianship for his nation. Now, you and I are not Israel. God today is not forming a body of people to reclaim the earth. He's forming the body of Christ. Our purpose is to reclaim the heavenly places. So we don't need, we don't require the angelic protection. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. You don't, have, you, don't, you don't have a guardian angel because you don't need a guardian angel. If you needed it, you'd have it. You have all provisions that God has for you to do everything God has for you to do. And you don't need angels to tell you what God has to say. Your book does that. You don't need angels to protect you. Why? Ephesians 1.13. You need to write this verse in your mind and don't forget it. In whom you also trusted. That's in Christ. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you hear the gospel, you trust Christ. In whom after you believe, once you trust Christ, when you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the, rede the redemption of the purchased possession. By that verse, right, four, chapter 4, verse 30, grieve not the Holy Ghost whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you trust Christ that very moment, God the Holy Spirit comes. He does five things to you. He crucifies you in Christ, circumcises you away from the old man. He R, he regenerates you. I, he indwells you. B, he baptizes you into Christ. And C, S, he seals you, cribs. You don't feel it. You don't know about it unless you read it in the Word of God. But it happens and it's as real as you are sitting in that seat. And the reality is you are placed into Jesus Christ and then you are sealed with, not by, but with the Holy Spirit. You literally live your, your life in an encapsulized environment. Did you ever take a, what is this stuff? I'm trying to think of the stuff my wife keeps feeding me. Oh. <laughs> Balance of nature. You know what that is. And it's a capsule. You can open it up and dump stuff out. You're literally in that capsule of the Holy Spirit. Nobody can open him up and drop you out. Literally protected by God the Holy Ghost. Now over in Luke chapter 16, I want to bring this up, the rich man and Lazarus, you remember that, that, that story? And Lazarus died, and what happened? Luke 16, 22, the angels came and carried him into Abraham's bosom. Why? Because angels are charged with protecting and guarding over God's earthly people. But you don't need an angel to take you. When you die, absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. How'd you get there? God the Holy Spirit seals you until what? The day of redemption. That's not the day you die. That's the day you get your glorified body. So you are sealed, protected by God the Holy Ghost until you get your glorified body. So when you die, your body leaves this, this body, this old carcass that you're walking around in, and it ain't so great. You get a little older, you'll know it ain't so great. And sometimes you groan within yourself wishing that you didn't have it anymore. But when you don't have it anymore, when you step out of that body, you step into the presence of the Lord because God the Holy Spirit is the one that transfers you there. And literally, it's like, it's like changing dimensions. You're not going to have to travel all out through the universe. You'll be in His presence immediately, instantly. If we had time, we could talk about how time works in eternity. You know, when you're having a good time, how fast it goes? You know, when you're having a bad time, it don't seem like it'll ever get over with? You know, sometime you, some, sometime you sit there and think, will Brother Rick ever get through? That's because you're bored. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. But sometime when you're excited about what's going on, you say, man, it's over already? Well, when you get in, you get in the Lord's presence, you know what it's going to be? Whoa! Is it ready to go back already? All, to, in my mind, when I think about it, 
I don't think about strolling around up there looking at things. I think about you get there, and the Lord says, okay, Rick, it's time to go back. Perception-wise, time, when you're having a good time, and when you're there, you have the best time you ever had. You don't need an angel because you've got, a, you've got God the Holy Spirit. But in order to experience all that there is to do out there, you need a new body. But you don't get that new body until the resurrection. So you're protected by God the Holy Spirit until then. Next week we're going to talk about your new body, what it's going to be like in heaven. So when someone goes to be with the Lord and they're there, they're enjoying the presence of God. You think things are beautiful down here? Listen, you're going to see, how, see the way God had it before it was effaced by sin. The surpassing beauty, wonder, and time's going to pass so quickly that you'll, you won't even realize it. It's going to be an environment that was already comfortable, that you're already comfortable with, just more splendid. So when your loved ones go to be with the Lord, they're entering into the way God intended it to be. A wonderful experience. And it won't be shocking except for its glory and its splendor. In order to appreciate that and function, you're not going to need a new body that matches that. So we'll talk about that next time. The hope of glory, that verse says, after you heard the word of, your, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you've trusted. All of this is God's free gift because Christ paid the debt, paid the price, rose again to give you that life. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The privilege we have of participating in God's creation the way God intends it to be is because of His Son provided that life for us. Took away our sin, took away our, our, our failures, took away all the things that we've done to mess things up and given us His life. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, all of that is yours for eternity. That's a wonderful thing. Don't live, don't, don't live discouraged in your life. Live with the joy of the Lord. And that, those things are designed to help you day by day appreciate the fact that life is more than what you see around you. It's everlasting life and the joy of it, seeing it live in your life. And walk in that newness of life for God's glory and for, for your, your joy. Okay? Anyway, that's, to me, I go home happy. Happy, happy, happy. I know I'm a happy husband. My wife told me I am. Happy believer, because God says you can be. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your grace. Thank you for a blessed hope that we enter into with the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We thank you for your grace. I pray these things would be as rich and real in our minds and hearts and impact us the way you designed them to for the Savior's glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right, praise the Lord. We're going to stand and sing number three. Number three.